All right. The moment is upon us. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. How's it going? What's going on? How are we? How are we doing today? Are you new to the show? If so, welcome. Hi, I'm Jay. Everyone else, thanks for being here. I wonder, how are things with you? I'd much rather hear about you than tell you about what's going on with me because, frankly, things haven't been that great, y'all. Really, every day has felt like triage in my house. And, I don't know, it continues to be a very trying and scary time. I feel like in my personal life, and maybe in our broader society, but at least definitely for sure in my own life, I, I feel like I've come up right up to the edge, right up to the end of what we're capable of understanding and accomplishing with science and technology. Like dealing with everything that's going on with my daughter and educating myself I can really see the limitations of our our medicine and our technology and what we actually know about the human psyche and how to treat certain conditions that we've observed in people. And it's just very overwhelming. and, And I imagine that there are many people out there who have also come up against this. And, you know, when I, when I look at it, it's like one direction, the, the reductionist technology, (laughs) just direction, it feels hopeless. It feels like I, I have to relinquish any agency I might have and basically just give over to the machine. That's what it feels like. Maybe that's an inaccurate way to put it, but that's what it feels like. Or the other possibility is that there are other sources. There are other sources of knowledge and wisdom and guidance. And that's why I've been having all these conversations about spirit and meditation and samadhi and all the things about yoga practice that aren't strength and flexibility or doing poses. We've been saying that for years, right? It's not about doing poses, but when it's not about doing poses, what it is about is not always very clear. And that's because it's where we go to a place that's not about mind, right? We go somewhere that's not limited by the confines of logic and reason that There's a place of magic, as I've been saying. There's a mystical reality or a mystical realm that we're functioning in as well. And recognizing that and inquiring into that, it challenges a lot of the predominant worldview. And I think that's what yoga teaches about from the very beginning. It's about being able to tap into these intuitive sources. And that's very much what we will be talking about today with Nishala Joy Devi. Nishala has been on the show three other times. In fact, I think she may be one of the first people, maybe the second people to ever be on the show four times. This is her fourth time here. And she reached out because she has a new edition of her book on the Yoga Sutras, The Secret Path of Yoga. She's been on the show talking about it some before. She was here a few years ago talking about meditation. In fact, she was sort of one of the people who got me started on that conversation. And she's gone back and written more specifically about the third and fourth padas of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. The enigmatic and infamous third and fourth pada that you don't hear much about. Well, Nishala tackled it, and it was just so wonderful to connect with her again. 
and to have what I feel is a very in-depth and important conversation about the third and fourth pada and about what I was just saying about going from devoted practice to higher consciousness is how Nishala wrote it. So <laughs> that's the title of this episode. And that's, I think, a perfect way to describe it. Going from devoted practice to higher consciousness. So fantastic to have this conversation with Nishala. And it really is my honor and pleasure to share it with you today. Real quick before we get to that, I do want to take a moment to express gratitude to our podcast premium subscribers. Today I want to shout out Haley Peterson and Kathy Davis. What's up, Haley and Kathy? Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate it. If you're new around here and you're enjoying what you've been hearing, and you want to help us out, you want to support this show, you want to get access to the full archives, the way to do it is become a podcast premium subscriber. Choose your rate. Cancel any time. If you want to get to the old episodes and you don't have money, then you just send us an email and we will give you a free account, no questions asked. But if you are able to contribute even just a little something, it really makes a difference. We are very grateful to everyone who does that. If you want to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or to find all my other stuff, my ongoing live stream classes, weekly teacher's call, and on-demand videos, all the stuff that I do, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all, I think I will just leave it there. I'm going to touch base with you on the other side if you want to stick around. But first, let's go ahead and get to this. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Nishala Joy Devi. Hello? Oh. Hello, Nishala. Hello, Jay. How are you? I am doing okay, all things considered, honestly. I just got over a bit of sickness, but I'm almost mostly recovered. And COVID? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. I didn't take a test, but it went through yeah. our house. And me too, me too. Um, yeah, and I'm already <laughs> recording, and I like to consider us having just begun. I don't want that to be a surprise to you. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, good, good, good. Well, I'm. Um, I was going to also say you wouldn't know it if you hadn't been listening to this show, but I've also been in quite a bit of um, crisis these days with my youngest daughter, who's dealing with mental health issues. So, oh, I'm so sorry to hear it's that. It's been a, a a trying time, but yes. I, well, as I've also been saying a lot on the show is that doing this, like having mm-hmm. moments like this where yeah. I, mm-hmm. I get to speak to people like you and have conversations about things that are important for me in my life, <laughs> in my soul, it's been a saving grace. So I'm so glad to speak to you again. And your timing is really quite good for other reasons, which I'm happy to share with you. You know, it, was, it was two years ago, a little over two years ago that you were last year and we talked about meditation in the yoga tradition. You wanted to, okay. ass- you, you asserted some things about what meditation was in the yoga, in the yoga tradition, different from other types of meditation and other types of traditions. And, you know, since then, over the, especially over the last year, I did a whole series of conversations about meditation in all these different traditions, Theravada Buddhism. I had Swami Satvavarama, Satvavarama. Oh my God, I can't get it right right now, but she was from the Shivananda, <laughs> uh, formerly uh-huh. from Shivananda, and she came on and talked about Hatha Yoga Pradipika. We talked about meditation and samadhi. I had Doug Keller on. He talked, gave us like a Muktananda read and a more scholarly take on some things. And so the question of meditation and samadhi has been happening a lot on, on the show. And then even for myself in the last six months, for the first time in five years, I decided to do a yoga teacher training and it's the first time oh. I ever did it online. I mean, I did them for years when I had a yoga center, but I swore them off because of something I heard you say, because I felt like it became like I was supposed to be this college level course or something. Like I have the knowledge, you pay me the big money and then I will bestow the knowledge on you and you'll, then you'll be a good teacher or something. 
And I think, I think most people <laughs> who've been around and had to had tried to facilitate other teachers know that there's something more to it. I always think of something Desika Char said. He said, there's like teaching for information or teaching for transformation. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, Beautiful. So yeah. in any case, all of this is a little long-winded, but very recently, I for the first time in a very long time, was having to facilitate learning around Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Uh-huh. <laughs> so <laughs> we've been doing all kinds of comparisons of different interpretations and translations. And in all of those, you know, honestly, those third and fourth chapter, those, you know, third and fourth padas are the ones that get the least consideration, it seems. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the fact that you decided to do a second edition of your book on the sutras specifically so you could write more chapters on those. So I was like, okay, good time to talk to Nishala. <laughs> so I'm, well, I'm, I'm curious what made you feel like you needed to write more. I mean, I can tell when I look back at the first edition, I think you did just under a hundred pages on pot of one. You did just over a hundred pages on pot of two, but you only did about 30 pages on t- pot of three and like even less, like five pages on pot of four. Right. Did you always intend to go back or what made you decide like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta go ahead and go do another edition and write these chapters. Well, first let me say, yay, that you're doing that because I'm thrilled to hear it. And I just want to apologize to the listeners that um, a little frog jumped in my throat Mm. and uh, I can't get it out. So Mm. I sound a little bit uh, froggy. Um, So forgive me for that. But I didn't want to miss our opportunity to be together. Um, So what happened was very interesting. Um, When I originally wrote the Pada 1 and Pada 2 of the sutras, My intention was to give people uh, the gift of seeing it from a different lens, from a little bit of a different option. Most of the sutras that are written are from a very, um, which we'll now call masculine for lack of a better term, but very um, mental orientation. They talk about the mind and control and words like that. And the, My experience in teaching was this was not the group that really wanted to hear about controlling the mind, etc. They wanted to learn more about the expansion rather than the contraction. Uh, That's at least my uh, experience with the students I was teaching. And to me, control is a contraction. It's it's a way that we, we pull in to control something. Whereas if you expand outward, it's it's a very different experience. And to me, that's really what spirituality is. It's not about control more than expansion. <clears throat> so I wanted to give the, the, um, the readers and my students a little bit of an experience of what it what it's like to come from the heart, which I took when when I went back to the Upanishads, and that's what the Upanishads talk about the heart. They never mention the mind. Mind is really a new term. Hmm. So I, I did that, and that's what I knew. I knew the first two padas very well. And I felt that that was um, the proper thing to do was to talk about what I knew, not what I was just learning about. And as far as my personal experiences, I really didn't feel like it was time to share that at, at that moment. Uh, so that was in 2008. And as a, one of the first things that I've written in the new uh, edition is that the fact that as we sit back and reflect how yoga has affected the world and has changed the world in so many ways, 50 years ago, no one even knew the word yoga. They thought it was something you put on your breakfast cereal in the morning uh, with fruit. And they didn't know anything about it, but now people are much more sophisticated. So what, so what I said is the world has been changed by yoga, but yoga has also been changed by the world. And I think that's a really important thing to step back and realize that when yoga came in, it came in very physical. 
And it has remained that way for the most part. Fortunately, the, the trainings have brought in the idea that they have to learn, people have to learn a certain amount of philosophy and wisdom teachings of yoga. So I just, I was resting basically on my laurels and um, people were using it in their trainings and I was getting a lot of wonderful feedback about it, which I was so happy to hear. And then something happened uh, around the time of the pandemic. It, it was an inward time. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people that it's interesting that for yogis, at least the ones I know and speak to, it was a time of retreat, of drawing inward. It wasn't a time of frustration and of sitting on the couch, eating all kinds of food and watching TV all day long. It was a time of introspection for a lot of people. And it certainly was for me. Um, I was asked to do a, um, a, to be part of a, uh, a website that was doing a comparison of the different translations of the sutras. And I, I realized I was the only one that was a modern woman involved in it. There were something like 20 different versions of it. And it made me start to think, well, maybe it's time to really expound upon the third and fourth sutras, uh, padas, sorry, that people are ready for it. And the ones that have been diligently doing the practices described in pada two are now maybe reaping some of the benefits, maybe getting some of the cities, the powers, and maybe they need to know that that's okay. So I started to start to think about it. And then I thought, well, I'll just do a part two. So that was the part one and did a part two. And then when I talked to my publisher, they said, no, no, we should just make it one book. So that's how that happened. And, you know, I agree with you, Jay. I've been reading a lot of the different commentaries and they don't really talk about the third and fourth sutras. Well, you know, one of my favorite uh, people I've learned sutras from is my friend Chase (laughs) Bossart. And he's a direct student of TKV Desikachar. And I remember I had him come do like a Sutras 101 workshop back when I had the center. And the Uh way he put it to people, like like the simplest way I've ever heard it say is like what the sutras are. He said, okay, Pada 1 is what is yoga. It just tells you what it is. He's like, Pada 2 tells you how you get in a state of yoga, like how you get yoga. And then he mm-hmm. said, pot of three is like what you can do when you have yoga. Now that you know how to get it, what can you do with it? <laughs> and then he said, pot of four is kind of like, I don't know what, like an epilogue where you go back over some of the things that were in one and three. That's what he said. <laughs> but uh-huh. nobody really has gone into it. What I would say is there's often some interpretations of like third pada when you said cities and powers People right. talk about that as like crazy stuff. Like you can make yourself right. float and all this stuff. But right. then I've also heard other kinds of interpretations. Like, again, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Desika Char because he doesn't, he's certainly capable of having that kind of scholarly view, but he considers them more like mnemonic devices to teach ideas. And that when you try to break down the Sanskrit into all these words, like that's not how it was originally taught. They didn't break right. it down exactly. into words originally. Exactly. So, so I think exactly. that, I think that for me, um, sometimes the cities are more like just a natural occurrence of things that happen and we experience them. We just don't really know it even a lot of times. Exactly. And, you know, that's uh, I'm smiling when you were talking about uh, Jessica Char, because when I originally was going to write my first volume, um, I I spoke to him about it and he was beaming. He thought it was a brilliant idea. He said Mm. there needs to be as many different views as possible so people can understand what sutures really are. Mm -hmm. So he was very, very positive about my doing it. And again, being the first woman to do it really from a feminine point, I I was happy to receive the blessings from these great teachers. Well, you know, I would, I would throw in one thing is because I had just been recently having all these kind of debates. And sometimes I question, why do we have to debate these things? But sometimes it seems like there's debates. <laughs> and it seems like there's the criticism I have heard of your version or whatever is that I think scholarly types or even some other folks just feel that 
you you veer too far from the text in your interpretations in terms of like strict Sanskrit translation. But I think that comes back to this idea of like, you know, how you utilize Sanskrit. I had Lauren Roche on recently and he he talked about that as well. And it seems to me another idea that I've been really thinking about from a wonderful woman named Indu Aurora. I mean, you probably know her. She's involved uh-huh. with IYT yeah. too. She was on the uh-huh. show recently. Uh-huh. And she said, knowledge that creates judgment versus knowledge that creates empowerment. And I was like, okay. So I've been really wanting to kind of resonate towards these directions of considering the text in ways that empower. So I don't even care if you veer from the text. I'm interested in what it says. (laughs) Well, you know, there's always going to be critics. And that's one thing I've learned from writing the first one. This was a big leap for a woman, not only to do it, but to do it from a heart-centered perspective. And the criticism I got I can't even begin to remember because I don't want to. Mm-hmm. But it all ca- came from people's minds. Nothing came from their heart. Mm-hmm. Nobody said to me, this doesn't feel right in my heart when you say it. People mm-hmm. instead said the opposite to me. When you say that, I feel it in my heart. So I take all the scholarly things as a grain of salt mm-hmm. Um it, it amazes me. They they just found this uh, this amazing black hole in the universe, mm-hmm. and I now that. They're, that. Re- <laughs> they're realizing that they're proving Einstein's theory, which a lot of people made so much fun of him. That well, how did he get this? Where did he get it from? It wasn't scientific. And I actually quote him in the samadhi aspect of this because he's clearly said, "I did not." study this i meditated on it and it revealed itself to me so anybody who thinks that you're going to get to realization from mental gyrations is is absolutely wrong because it's never been that way you have to leave your intellect at a certain point and go and leap with your heart you cannot carry the thoughts and the mind into samadhi there's no place for it It doesn't exist. It's not on the same plane. So critics can say what they like. Also, I think that we have to understand, and this is why the second part is there, that only by practice and experience can you even begin to understand the third and fourth pada. They say you can't even understand it without samadhi. There has to be a certain level of letting go of the mental thinking and the mental gyration, including the Sanskrit language, <laughs> and go with it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I think I appreciate it so much because it's something else I've been talking a lot about because in this pandemic time, for me, and I've said this many times on the show, people who are listening are like, yeah, 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 Jay, but I, I need you to hear it, is that I feel like a number of aspects of my practice, like I sometimes would say devotional aspect, or, you know, some people would say more spiritual aspects, but like chanting and certain right. ex- letting myself have time and space in nature and to release in the sort of way that you're talking about or expand in the kind of way that you're talking about. Right. It's right. been the most important thing for my health and well being. Yep. And it, yep. I feel like when I've been wanting to talk with people about it, about, yoga teaching us that we live in a consciousness-based reality and and the experience of that in our systems and what that implies to us. And the, as you've said, it's a fundamentally mystical thing, yoga. Yes. And it, to me, sometimes a lot of people in the yoga world, um, recently I've been like saying God for the first time ever. Like I never thought of myself as being religious. I like got into yoga to get away from organized religion, you know? But it seems to me what you're saying is that there's certain aspects, and maybe that's what the third and fourth pot are more about, is that you would have to kind of um, let go of the kind of reductionist thinking. Exactly. Yes. That kind of predominates our modern societies. Not trying to like bash modern society, but we have this 
reductionist, like postmodern randomness idea rather than a harmony idea, you know? And it seems like yoga is teaching us, like I've also been really into the word animism or something, like it's teaching us, like if you look at the beginning of the Mahabharata, the rishis are in the form of deers, like they can transform, you know? Right, right. And, but it, it, you can't take that literally either, though. See, this is the thing. Why all of a sudden are people deciding to take the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali literally when mm. nothing else is being taken literally? Mm. You talk about the, the rishis in the form of deer. Well, yeah. someone reads that and they go, what really closes the book and walks away. But you have to realize that within that, there's a teaching. There's something. Why a deer? Why would they be a deer? Can you find anything more gentle than a deer and non-intrusive? You know, so you have to really go into the mysticism. And this is, you know, Jay, this is something that happened early on with yoga. Everybody was trying to demystify it. Mm. And I would always, always laugh. I said, it's like taking the wetness out of water. <laughs> you can't do it. It doesn't, it's impossible. It's a mystical tradition. And that's why there's very little scripture actually written about yoga. Most of it is practices. Most of it is something that you do on your own and you by yourself with yourself to transcend that mind. And if you get stuck in the mind, like everybody's worried about getting stuck in cities I'm more worried about people getting stuck in their mind. <laughs> they analyze it and they go over it and over it. Mm. When you talk about something like chanting, there's no logic to chanting. Mm -mm. You chant because it feels good. It feels right. And then after a while with the chanting, you don't feel the, the body. You don't feel, experience the mind because you're in a place beyond that. Mm. That's a mystical experience. It's a transcendental minute experience and pada three and four tells us that everything we learned in one and two is now transformed into a different way of looking at it can i give you an example please do um <clears throat> i think this is a really uh pretty obvious one and pretty good one in a way when we look at Sutra 133, which is one of my favorite, and I think a lot of people too, and it's lovingly called the four locks and the four keys. Um, and it says really clearly, to preserve openness of heart and calmness of mind, nurture these attitudes, right? And they give you four attitudes to different kinds of people. The first one is the one I wanted to mention. It says kindness to those that are happy. So in Pada 1, which this is described in, this is exactly what we need to learn. We need to learn that if we want to preserve our openness of heart and calmness of mind, that we nurture these attitudes. So to be kindness to those that are happy, right? Now, if you go forward to, to Pada 3, you see kindness again brought up. And it says, by some yama on kindness and other virtuous qualities, one develops the power. This is, this is where the powers come in. One develops the power to transmit those qualities to others. Now, I think this is very, very significant. I don't know if, uh, if that came across that way. But when the idea of kindness was first introduced, it was offered as an evolutionary practice toward oneness. Okay, that's what how it was represented. Yet here, they assume that you have already embedded this in your heart, that you have already brought forward this. And now the job is to help others see this and that kindness then spreads to others because you have embodied it. So to me, this is the brilliance of the sutras. Does that make sense? It sure does. I mean, I think that at the end of every episode I've ever done, I think this is 325. I say, I ask that we be kind. I think to me, it's like the special sauce. <laughs> yep. the, yep. So I, I couldn't agree more. And I do like to think that 
if one roots himself in kindness that it spreads to others. I think that I've seen that happen. So I, I couldn't agree more. I think it, it, it makes me, I'm so interested in the fact that something you wrote at the beginning of the book, I want to make sure, I mean, the beginning of these new sections of the book, I'm, I want to make sure I got it right. Is it, did I read it right that you said only the first five limbs have commentaries in the second book? Yes. Like they list correct. the other one. They list Donna, yes. Diana, yes. and Samadhi yes. in the second book, but they don't comment but then on it. It ab abruptly stops at one at 255. It just stops. You they see, because last about, time you were here, we talked about Donna, the last three, the, the enigmatic right. last three, and you gave right. us the 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 oil leather, the oil exactly the, the, good memory, the oil good memory. leather, the metaphor. I remember <laughs> that well. But yeah. I guess this is a real more fleshing out for you on that stuff, right? Well, that that's because what I did last time, I assume, is I went into the third pada, hmm. even because I did translate that in the in the uh, first edition. Mm -hmm. I did do I did up to uh, three four. I did uh, all four beginning ah, sutras. That's right. The, you did, like I and, said, like yeah. the first 30 pages or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But now I've continued on with that in, right. in that particular way. But yeah, because it always struck me. Everybody always teaches meditation as a practice. And I, it was incongruent with the way the sutras presented it because suddenly after glimpsing the inner light, the senses contently dwell within, which is 255, and is, that's pratyahara. All of a sudden, it stops. And it moves into pata three. And I thought, why would it do that? What is pata three? I kept on analyzing. What is it? This is where the powers, this is where the gifts along the way, as I call them, come in so it said to me that meditation is not in fact something you practice it is something that comes after practice it's the gift it's when you let go of practice i had this very funny uh experience which i was very excited when i was writing all this as i get excited and i was talking to a group of uh people that i knew a small group um and we were taught, and then they said to me, well, what's so different about this? I said, well, it, what's different about it is for those of us that have been practicing for a long time, it basically says, let go of your technique. If you're using a mantra and you've been using it for 20 years, let go of it at a certain point and go into a deeper state because the mantra keeps you with the mind. You have to repeat it. They looked at me like I had just. I don't know what, done something <laughs> horrific. They said, let go of our mantra. I can't do that. I could never do that. I said, you don't have to permanently do it. Just in meditation, start with it. And then at a certain point, let it go and see where you go. Jump off the cliff, whatever it is. So mm. the attachment that we get to these practices prevents us from moving forward to the higher states. And that's why I called part two from the devoted practice to higher consciousness, because the practices themselves help us to calm the mind, calm the body, get the energy moving. But then what happens? Then we have to move to the higher consciousness. All right. Well, in that respect, <laughs> moving to the higher consciousness, it, um, it's interesting to me that you you were specifically talking about not getting trapped in the mind. And is yes. that, that's why you say like dharana is not concentration, right? Because constant, because that's the way it's normally listed, right? Right, right. And so why, why is, why do you think dharana is not concentration? Because it keeps us in the mind. Did I get that right? Well, it's because I use a different word. I use it as contemplation rather than concentration. Okay. okay. Because to me, when someone's concentrating, there's a um, there's a tension. Uh, you're you're when you're concentrating on something, and I've seen this with people who are beginning to meditate. 
their face isn't relaxed. The brow furrows, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and that's not the purpose. So I changed the word or the tra- – see, it, you can't really translate Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi into English. There, there's no equivalent. So you have to sort of make up uh, something that's close enough and then explain it. I remember the first – when I started first teaching years ago in Germany – and I kept on talking about um, the spirit and they didn't know what I was talking about. So we, I had to explain it. And then we agreed and we used the English word. So it's, it's a little bit like that. Um, the frustration of, of finding these words within the English language. So I use the word contemplation because it's more of that. You, it's more, you're, you're more getting more con- contemplative mm-hmm. uh, by going in than you are by concentrating. So that's why I use those terms. And I, I used meditation for uh, dhyana because it's, a, it's, it's a, um, the next step in. I mean, does I that think make it, sense? It does make sense. I, I think yeah. most folks have a good, I mean, I don't know, maybe most folks, but a lot of people I know have a good sense of like pratyahar, like I'm going to go inwards and like right. sense from in. And then I think I've done a lot of practices that are clearly about developing sustained attention. So you're you're directing attention, right? And then you can direct attention in a lot of different things, whatever you want, really, right? Right. And but at some point, what you're describing isn't that you've done that, and you can do that. You 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 have facility with that, right? Like if I want to at any given moment, I can definitely point my mind something and keep it there for. Mostly as long as I want, usually, you know what I mean? Like, I feel yeah. like I could do that. <laughs> and if you have that basic foundation, then that leads to other experiences that are not that, that like you're describing are something else that are harder to find words for. <laughs> right? Exactly. And getting, get, let, get, let's get back to Einstein. Okay. Right. The same thing. So that's what he did. He was, he was focused on this. How did, how is this, what are the properties of light? What can, what is this? And then as he did, so let's use that because you talk about a point. Now a point to me is everything is brought in to that singular moment or point. But what happens when you move through something? So like, for instance, if you're moving through a tunnel, as Einstein described how he did, and he moved through this tunnel and all of a sudden, there was no boundaries anymore because one pointedness means there's a boundary. You are, fo- you are focusing, but at a certain point, that point, that singular point becomes infinity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the fractals, That's what, the fractals. Exactly. exactly. Yes. That's what the third and fourth book is trying to tell us. Mm. That and, a- and it's also, and why people are getting upset unfortunately, <laughs> is that the Pratyahara practices include everything we think of as meditation. It includes mantra. It includes observing the breath and observe, uh, observing the mind. Anything that you use the mind to control the mind or to focus the mind mm-hmm. is not meditation. You're still in the mind. You're still using the mind. You have to even move out if you're of like mind. if you start like okay, I'm doing this chant, but then you release into the chant and in the experience yes, of the chanting, exactly, exactly. You're not focusing the mind. You're somewhere else. You're just doing the chant, almost like it's being channeled or something. Exactly, or you're listening to it. Yeah, you no longer yeah. are the driver. You are. Right. You have now become the passenger. You are the experiencer rather than making the experience happen. And that's why, to me, it's brilliant that, uh, that Pada 2 describes all this, and we do the practices. It describes everything that we do. And then it says, okay, now you got that. Now let's move further. And at a certain point, you have to just take your hands off the wheel, off the, off the um, Ferris wheel, holding and go and just go along for the ride because that's what happens otherwise you meet people who have been doing the same thing for 30 and 40 years 
and have never had an experience. Because every time the mantra or the breath or whatever it is starts to slip away, they grab it back. And instead, I don't know if you remember that beautiful uh, little poem from uh, The Little Prince. I don't know. And it said, he called me to the edge. No, I will not go. He called me to the edge. No, I will not go. He pulled me to the edge. He pushed me and I flew. Huh. That's what I'm talking about. Wow. There's wow. something at a certain point. It, it, it's no longer about practice. It's right. about experiencing and being. And, and I think I say that in, as we, it transfers doing into being. And when I hear people say, I'm going to go do yoga, yeah, right? It means to me that they are practicing. But when you are yoga, you have become that. You have become the union. You have, become, you have come back to the union in the heart. And it seems like when you do things like that, you, you're able to receive or hear things. Like even someone like Einstein, you've been referencing People, he, he didn't discover his discoveries through random control trials. No, no. Or even <laughs> thinking about it. At yeah. a certain point, he had to let go of the thinking and experience it. There's a, I, I don't know if people watch TV, but there's an amazing um, uh, show on called Genius. And one of the, it's a three-part series, and one of them is Einstein. And in it, they portray that he starts to see a light wave and instead of standing back and observing it, which would be a mental, he rides the wave. It's unbelievable. Mm. He rides the wave and he knows how the wave functions because he's part of it. He's experiencing it. Mm. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not just talking about being kind. We're experiencing that kindness that flows from every cell and every energy part of our being so that others experience that kindness and feel what, what it feels like and, do, and then bring it to other people too. It's that kind of thing. We, we become charging stations. We become generators in a way when we get to that point that we are able to beam that out to others so they can also experience their divine nature. This is not a selfish uh, experience. This is something that once we attain it, we ha it, other people feel it too. It's just like anything else. Uh, Lauren Roche was on recently and he said, it's the, the love current that, flows between earth and heaven through your spine. <laughs> <laughs> and That's I nice. guess it makes me think about um, samadhi and how I, I was recently having a conversation with someone and it was sort of like, well, how do you know if you've experienced samadhi? And <laughs> great. That's a great question. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah, I thought so. That's why I brought it up to you. Yeah, I, thought you yeah, I think that's response. a great question. <laughs> I think it's a great question because... And, and it's funny to me because in, um, I think it's, it's, uh, one or two, part of one or two, all the samadhis are described, savitarka, savitarka, all of it are described. And I say very clearly then, if you identify the samadhi, you're immediately out of samadhi because there's no mind in samadhi. So how do you know that you've been there? Well, there's a couple things. One is, when you return from samadhi, you have been changed in some way. Something is different. It may be your senses. The uh, colors may be brighter. You may hear things differently. You may experience things differently. So it's in, you reflect upon the samadhi on how it affects your everyday life. Because to judge a uh, samadhi is almost impossible because there's no mind there. Mm -hmm. So it's, are you a little bit kinder? Are you a little bit happier? Are you a little bit more introspective? It can be anything, but something has changed. And that's why I encourage people 
For instance, I just did a four hour uh, meditation intensive the other day. And what I encourage people to do after that, don't speak. It was all in silence. Don't speak, but go and write down what you experienced. Because that way you get to reflect on it. Oh, this is different. This happened differently. And, and from there you get that. I mean, to be very honest and open about this, Jay, I couldn't write this 10 years ago. I didn't have that ability to reach into the cosmos and get this information. I had to go through things myself mm -hmm. in Samadhi to be able to write this. So I think it's something that we, we develop and we grow. And the only way we can do that is to continue to do the practices and then let go at the same time. Do the practices and then let go. And eventually we will fly. That's what it says, right? Do it and then yep. relinquish it, right? That's it. That's well, it. You know, it made my idea to that question of how do you know if you were Samadhi, it's kind of like asking, like, how do you know the tomatoes ripe? Yeah. Like the only way you know you have to eat it and taste it. <laughs> yeah. Seems like that's the yeah. only way you would know. And but then it's that's about it. the naming of it or like labeling it or whatever. But well, that's, I think you have like a the, sugar in the pitcher of water. Yeah. Didn't you have that? Right. I read that. That's what yeah. made me think yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, very. You're very good. <laughs> yes, it was because you have the sugar and you have the water, right? And yeah. then what happens in samadhi is the sugar is put in the water and it dissolves. You can't see it anymore. The only way you know it's there is if you taste it. And you mm. can t you know by its sweetness that it's there, but mm. you can't see the sugar anymore. It's gone. Where did it go? It absorbed. Then this is the last uh, pada absolutism. It completely absorbed into the um, the water. So it's it's not. Is it something that most of us occur have on a daily basis? Not most, but don't discount that. Because we need those experiences to remember who we are in the midst of our busy lives and to remember that that person sitting next to us, we don't know what they just went through. And the only way that we can be with them is to be with kindness and compassion. That's the only option because we don't know anything else about them. You know, there's a, a Sutra 326. I love, I really love this. It says, by samyama on the inner light in the heart, one is granted powers of deep perception. So we get back to this intuition, this idea that in the heart, we hold this, these powers of knowing. So when you look at someone and they're maybe irritating you, if you really look through the heart, not through the judging mind, you may see that this person is suffering. And instead of being nasty to them, you give them kindness instead. And I think this is what it does. So not only does it bring us to a higher level of consciousness out of the body, but it also embodies us to have that higher consciousness when we're working and dealing with people on a daily basis. And that will change the world. Oh, I like that idea. I, I would like yeah. to believe it to be true. I, I know it to be true. I don't want to believe it. Yeah. I know it. It's not a yeah. belief. You, it's a fact. You do know it. Yeah. I do, you know, do it. know it. Yeah. I, I guess I want to ask you, you, you keep using the word samyama. And yes. I think okay. most, most folks People are familiar with the Dada, Dhyani, and Samadhi. So right. can you say a little something about... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.